Good to, to be together this morning. Welcome to everyone that's here. Welcome to everybody watching at home. Um, yeah, we're glad to be able to come together this morning and worship together. Um, and um, just to remember God's presence. Well, we'll be talking about that in our, in our message and, and why Kel, I think, chose to sing about that. But just remembering that, that we are in God's presence. We're in God's presence all the time as his believers, but then I think especially as we come together as his people, as the, the temple of God, that, that we are in the presence of God. And so let's just um, remember that and take that seriously this morning and just how amazing that is and how wonderful that is and how um, meaningful that is as well. So just encourage you on that. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is that uh, uh, Stephen uh, let me know this morning that he's not feeling well, so there will be no youth group tonight. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, then the second one is that next week, as I shared last week, next Sunday at 7 p.m., we'll be having a, a community prayer service. Um, it'll be hosted at, at Christ the King in Blaine, um, which is old, the old Peace Arch Assembly of God building, if you're not sure where that's at. So I'd encourage you all to come out to that and be a part of that. If you, if you don't feel like you can come out to that and be a part, I encourage you just to be taking that hour at home from 7 to 8 to be praying together. Uh, this is something that um, we as, as uh, pastors, we, we meet together and, and pray weekly and we just had a heart um, to be able to come together as our churches we, we did you know an event in October where we did that every week and um, we'd like to uh, make this more of a regular thing we're going to start off quarterly and just kind of see how it goes and grows from there but uh, just to be coming together as the church of Blaine and Birch Bay and, and, and praying together and just being together um, united so yeah, I encourage you guys to be a part of that um other than that, let's just open with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, move back into our singing uh, of worship time. Um, God, we thank you for your goodness to get to us. God, we thank you that as we gather together, that we are your temple, that your presence is here with us. Um, and God, that, that, that by your Holy Spirit, God, I don't think that just means that as we are in this building together, um, that your presence is with us. But as we gather as your church, as, as people are meeting together in their homes and, um, and watching the service together, as people um, just from, um, different, from, from their homes by themselves, but, but we are part of the same body, as we, we come together and we just focus on you together, as we worship together, we are in your presence together as your church, God. Um, may we just be mindful of that. Um, and may we just be um, reaching out to one another and making sure that, that um, 
that that presence that, that we have is shared amongst us as a church, God. Um, just continue to, to help us to navigate this time, to love one another well through this time, and to love um, the world through this time, God. We thank you for your love and your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. echoing what Justin shared here about God being near us. Just as we sing this next song about Christ being all around us, it's just kind of a reminder that God is always around us. And when we sing these things and we cry out to him to be around us in our hearts and to be our strength and to be our eyes, to be in us and around us in all of the circumstances where we're joyful and where we're struggling, we're asking him to help us to realize that he is there and to help us to see him and to invite him into those places where we're not letting him take control. And so let's just call upon the Lord and just be encouraged that he's saying, yes, I'm here with you and I love you and I'm strong and I'll take care of you. So let's just sing and praise him as well.
God, I just pray this morning that we, we would just rest in that goodness, God, that we would know that you are good. God, there are many things going on in our church, in our lives, in our world um, that can make us lose sight of that. But God, may we know the truth. May we hold on to that. May we walk in the light of your goodness. May we proclaim it and rejoice in it. May we proclaim it to the world around us, God, that you are good. You are for us. God, may we just be um, willing to show what good is, to not let the world or the culture define good and evil, but to, to listen to what you say and to stand for that. And may we just proclaim who you are to the world around us, and may people come to know you and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Cal. If you'd like to worship um, by giving, you can do that at bcfgiving.churchcenter.com. Um, thank you to everybody who's done that and has continued to give. Um, if you're watching us for the first time, we're, we're not just after your money. We're not necessarily asking you to give, but we think supporting what we do is the work of the church. And we want to continue to be able to support the ministries and the people and the missionaries and the, the people and the things in our community that we do. And so thank you for those that have continued to give um, as, as we've done that. Let's go ahead and move into our sermon time. Um, so we're going through um, Philippians. Uh, continue to go through Philippians today. Um, and um, I, I you know, got a lot of feedback as we were in the Advent season, and we'd have videos from different people in the church, you know, just as we haven't been able to connect the same way and have everybody gathered together, and there's people we miss, you know, just got a lot of feedback how good it was to be able to see people and, um, at the Christmas Eve service. So not sure we're going to be able to do this every week, if, if that'll be realistic to do or not, but I uh, decided to try to have to start uh, having some people read our scripture that we're going to be uh, looking on each week, and so everybody can welcome uh, Teresa this morning. So. Hi, church family. We sure miss you, and we can't wait till we can be all together again. I'm going to be reading from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, and this is actually one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and I hang on to this a lot, so especially right now. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So as we've gone through um, Philippians, you know, uh, this, this part that, that Teresa just read from, this is towards the end of the book, um, this letter that, that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. And we said that he's giving them a, a series of commands here of, of uh, things that they, uh, that they should do um, as a church. And, and, and we saw four different th commands that he gives them there, rejoice, um, uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, let your gentleness, uh, your graciousness, is kind of what I talked about last week, uh, be known to everyone. Um, and then today, the Lord is at hand. And then lastly, do, do not be anxious about anything, but, but make your request known to God. We'll talk about that last week. We said, why these four commands? Why these four statements um, does Paul make these? And I said that as I, as I kind of reflected on that and asked that question, what I, I noticed in all of them is that um, in times of trial, and times of difficulty, which the Philippian church was experiencing, and, and those things, these are all things that can get lost in times of suffering, in times of trial. Like we can, it's easy to lose our joy in times of trial. It's easy to lose our graciousness towards others in times of trial. Um, it's easy um, for us to be anxious in times of trial. Um, and, and then this one today... Um, is, is kind of stands out because it's a little bit different. It says, the Lord is near. And this one isn't so much a, a command as just a statement. The, uh, the Lord is near. And so what does it mean? How do we lose this 
um, in, in times of trial. And I think to illustrate that, first we kind of unpack what does it mean that the Lord is near. And there's two kind of ways that overlap, and so I have a, a video demonstration to kind of help us illustrate this point. My, my uh, kids and I, in the last like six months or a year, we discovered the slow motion uh, feature on my, on my phone. And so we've been having lots of fun taking slow motion videos. This is a video that, that Tresden T and I took yesterday. If you hear that growling, it's not an animal. That's just my voice. <gasps> All right. So right at this moment, the water balloon is near to Tia. The water balloon is near to Tia. What does that mean, that the water balloon is near to Tia? That it's about to hit her. So, so it's near to Tia and that it's about to hit her. Is there any other ways that the water balloon is near to Tia? It's very close, right? Spatially, it's near to Tia that is very close. Like she could reach out and touch it if she could pause time like this. She could reach out and touch it. So spatially, it's near to Tia. But then in a time sense, temporally, it's near to Tia as well. It's about to hit her, right? So um, now just so you can see the conclusion of the video, because I'm sure you're all wondering what it all looks like next. <laughs> 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 all right um so so he said the water balloon is near to tia oh, actually i should say thank you tia is not here in, in in the building this morning but she's watching at home so thank you to tia for being willing to get hit with a water balloon in 39 degree weather just for a sermon illustration so um yeah and thank you for Tresden to be willing to throw a water balloon at your sister in 39 degree weather <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so the balloon is near to Tia in two ways. There's the spatial way and the temporal way, the spatial way and the time way. So when we say that the Lord is near, when Paul says the Lord is near, is that a spatial thing or a time thing? Both, both, right? It's both. Um, as Christians, you know, what we believe as Christians is that, that God made the world good, that he made it so that we would be in his presence as, as his creation, that we would partner with him in stewarding and, 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 and creation, but that sin entered the world and it, and it broke our relationship with him, it broke our relationship with another, it broke our relationship with creation, uh, but that in the person of Jesus, that God came to be with us, came to be near to us in his person and to bring and establish his kingdom where he would restore things to the way that they were supposed to be, Excuse me. <clears throat> um, and so he's near. Uh, he was near to us and his person. He was near to us as he brought the kingdom. Remember, this, uh, this kind of the same word in Greek uh, that, it, that he uses when he says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, he's near to us in his presence. But also we believe that, that he died and, and he rose again to, to be able to, to usher in that new creation and so uh, he's near to us and that we experience his kingdom now, that we experience him by his Holy Spirit now, but we also anticipate his return, that that, that, that is near as well. And so um, sometimes when you read commentaries on Philippians, people debate what Paul means by this, but I think Paul means both of these things at once, and I think both of them speak to us. And so kids, on your sermon notes there, like one of your questions was, what does it mean that he's near? It means uh, that he's near both in his presence to us and that he is about to re that he's uh, uh, going to return to us soon, and this is our hope that we have as Christians. Um, but uh, by the same to like we know that that God is near us as we walk through life, that He leads and He guides us, He comforts us, um, and, and and so. Uh, we have to remember this as Christians because this is an easy thing for us to lose. In the same way that we can lose our joy or that we can lose our graciousness or we can become anxious, we can also lose this hope that we have that the Lord is near, that he is present in our lives, that he is about to, re that he is about to return and to restore his kingdom. We can lose sight of those things. We can lose the hope that we have as Christians. And so, so Paul says this to us because it speaks to us, right? Even in our situation, as we continue to experience all that's going on in the world politically around us, we remember that the Lord is near. 
As we continue to struggle through the pandemic and the effects of that, we remember that the Lord is near. As we wrestle with all the conflict that's in our world because of some of those things, we remember that the Lord is near. As we feel loneliness or sadness or depression, as we struggle with sickness or disease or fear, as we, as we um, struggle with sin in our lives and our own decisions, we remember that the Lord is near. We don't lose sight of that hope that we have in Christ. And so what I'm going to look at today is we're just going to look at these, these in Greek, they're just three little words, um, these three little words and, and what it means to keep that hope and what, what uh, Paul is saying to the Philippian church and by extension to us as well. And so what does it mean that, that the Lord is near us? So going all the way back to Psalm 34, you know, we always talk about like uh, God in the Old Testament is the angry, vengeful, whatever God, but, but God is a God of love all the way through. And we have one of the most beautiful things to talk about, the nearness of God. It comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. It says, the Lord Yahweh, Yahweh is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Right? So, so oh, a characteristic of, of God that we see all throughout Scripture from, from um, the beginning to the end, and, and even that, you know, he just talked about our hope as Christians is that God desired to be near people and that sin uh, messed up and ruined that relationship, but God desires to be with his people. And so the hope, first hope that we have that Paul is reminding the Philippians of is that God is with us. God is with us. Right? That's what we celebrate at Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us. It doesn't always feel like God is with us. Right? When things aren't going the way we want, we can feel abandoned. We can feel alone. We can be questioning God's presence in our lives. But what Scripture reminds us, what, what the, the incarnation, the coming of Jesus reminds us, that what the cross reminds us is that God is with us. He has not abandoned us. He has not left us. Even when we feel alone, we are not alone because he is walking with us. And we we say, well, God, if he's there, then why isn't he responding? You know, I have these issues. I have these problems. I have these difficulties. I see the evil and things in the world around me. If God is with us, then why isn't he responding? Um, So if you don't know, we homeschool our children. And and sometimes um, our kids uh, have, have a math problem. And, uh, and, and it's difficult, it's challenging, it's too hard for them. And, and, and when that happens, they look at, look at us and they say, oh, mom and dad, thank you guys for, for uh, teaching me and, and for, um, you know, uh, challenging me and, and encourage me to do something that's too hard for me. I really appreciate all that you do for us as parents. I'm going to work hard and solve this problem. Right? No, that's not what my kids do, right? I won't call any of them out by name, but, but, the, but we'll get the... Oh, this is too hard. I can't do this. Oh, just tell me the answer. Right? Parents, even if you don't, don't homeschool, a lot of you experienced uh, homeschooling for the first time this year. Never get your, your, your kids crying out to you. Just tell me the answer. Now, would I be a good dad? Would I be helping them if I just tell them the answer to the math problem? No. No, why not? <laughs> So I'm supposed to give them a challenge to make them more know, know more, right? <laughs> Good job, Thane. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I need to encourage them to be able to be challenged. I need to encourage them to be able to learn and grow. And yet it is frustrating and difficult to them because they, they know I have the answer. They know I know how to do the problem. And, and so it can seem challenging to them. But I have good reasons, uh, not just good reasons in general, but good reasons for them to leave them challenged and frustrated by the problem. And I think the same thing can be true of us. We don't always understand the purposes that God has, the the, the things that he's doing when when things are not going the way we want, when things are not happening the way we want them to be. um, We we, we can can, uh, say, God, are you really there? We get frustrated and say, just just do this, God. Just get me out of this. Just just help uh, this way. Do this thing. And God doesn't respond, and we say, well, God must not really be there. And the truth is, he is there. He's wanting us to learn and grow, to be a good, loving father to us. He's encouraging us to to do things that are challenging and difficult and hard that we never thought we'd be able to make it through, and he's he's growing us in them. And I admit that it can be hard always to understand and see what God is doing, but I trust that he is there. When I look back at my life, 
And I think about the times in my life that in the moment I most question God's presence. When I look back at those times, and some of the times I can most clearly see his presence in my life. I thought about doing the whole footprints on the sand poem, but then I thought that was like really played out and everything. But, but it's kind of the, the same thing. If you don't know that, that poem, it's the, the idea that there's a, a person had a dream and they looked and they, they saw one set of footprints in their life um, and, and, and they called out to God, like, you know, like they said, the, the, that I look at my life and it's like a trail uh, through the beach and the sand. And when I look back at the hardest times, there's only one set of footprints and, and God, why weren't you there with me? And God says, that was the times when you saw only one set of footprints. That was the times I was carrying you along. Right? God is with us. He is helping us through those times. And when we endure, when we, when we, when we overcome, when we, we look back, we can see his work in our lives. And so that's the first thing that we remember when, when we're reminded that the Lord is near, is that he is with us even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it. But what's interesting about this verse is so that, you know, we just read that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. But the very next verse says... Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yahweh delivers him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of, of, of the righteous, but Yahweh delivers uh, from all. So, so which afflictions does God deliver us from? All. God delivers us from all afflictions. And so the, the presence of God in our lives does not just remind us that he is with us, but that he will help us. That God will help us. Now, we can't, I think we can go so quickly like to this, he delivers us from all, but we have to remember the verse also says, many are the afflictions, right? We, we think God doesn't rescue us quick enough, and so he doesn't really rescue us. God doesn't deliver us quick enough, and so, so he doesn't really uh, uh, rescue us. Or, or because we experience affliction that God is not really there, but the verse teaches us we will have afflictions, We'll have a lot of afflictions. In fact, the way the verse reads to me that many are the afflictions of the righteous is that, that oftentimes righteousness in this life, in this broken world, is actually going to bring on more affliction than unrighteousness. Right? We will experience suffering. We'll, we'll experience hardship, but God will deliver us from them all. And how does he do this? I think there's, there's two ways. Uh, first is that he removes us from the problem, right? Like you, you lose your job, uh, you, you experience affliction from that. You pray to God, and he provides a new job for you, right? Something like that. Or, or, you know, you get sick, you pray, and God heals you miraculously from that sickness. God delivers us from those things. And those are easy to see. But what about the times that you, you don't get a new job and you lose your house? What about the times when you, when you aren't healed and you struggle with some sort of chronic uh, uh, pain or sickness in your life? What about, what about times that, that of, of things that God can't really restore? You know, you lose a child, like God may provide, give you another child, but that doesn't make up for the loss that you've, you've suffered and the grief that you've had in your life. So what about those times? How does God deliver us from those? If he delivers us from all afflictions, does he deliver us from those things as well? Um, and I'd say, uh, yes. Um, for that, and it kind of comes to our second piece, though, the, excuse me, sorry. Um, that the, the, there's a second way that God delivers us as well, and that is that he changes our outlook on those things. Right, that, that he changes our outlook on those things. Is that, um, that our pers- by, by, by having our perspective soaked in the mind of God, that, that, that as we bring these things to him in prayer, which we're going to talk about next week, as we do that, that even that affliction that we felt, that we can be delivered from that affliction by seeing that God accomplishes something more in it. Uh, one of my favorite verses, I use it often, but it's such a good verse when it comes to this, this idea of suffering, is this, you know, that Paul says that our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. I meant to use a different translation, but I actually use this one. Um, I, like, it's actually like the other, another translation better. It says this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. 
uh, that, that, that what we, 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 the perspective we gain when we have an eternal perspective, when we don't lose our hope, when we recognize that the Lord is near, that, that he has an eternal kingdom that he's preparing us for and that we get to be a part of, is that the suffering and the things that we experience in this world are light. They're momentary. They, they seem difficult. They seem challenging to us. They seem uh, lasting long for us. But in compared to what awaits us and the length of eternity... These things are light, and not only are they light, but they are preparing us for that. The wonder and the glory of the kingdom to come is going to be greater when we realize the, the brokenness of this world, right? If everything were, were just hunky-dory in this world, if God just immediately delivered out, uh, us out from anything and never let us experience affliction, we wouldn't really understand the greatness of the kingdom that is to come. And so even as we suffer, even as, as, as we struggle, we, we, we are able to, to, with eternal mindsets, have our perspective changed. God delivers us from those troubles because of the hope that we have. And when I say hope, it's hope is something that, that we know and we look forward to, not something like we use in the, in the sense of, I hope this happens, but the hope that we have that we look forward to, that, that it helps to change our perspective. And so we're delivered from a mindset where we're consumed by grief, consumed by suffering, and we're able to shift our thinking to God. Right? And then by the same token, I don't want to make light of anybody's suffering or trials, but we are delivered from all of them. Like at some point, even if you have a chronic disease where you're, where you're suffering in this life, even if you, you have the, the grief of, 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 of uh, you know, death or loss in this life, this life is not forever, and eternity is. Right? We will be delivered uh, uh, from this. And as God's people, we will experience his goodness forever. We will experience a place where there's no more, where, where he wipes away every tear from our eyes. Where death has been defeated and overcome. He will deliver us from this place and from the suffering that we experience now. And so you may be in a time in your life right now where you are experiencing something difficult, something challenging, and you're crying out to God, deliver me, deliver me. And his answer to you, it might be to miraculously provide something, to miraculously deliver you from a situation, but it might just be simple of, of, of simply him turning your mind to his, helping you to see things from an eternal perspective, to teach you what he is, he's doing or growing, or just to teach you the, the humility and obedience of being able to submit to his sovereignty and his goodness, even when you don't understand what is going on. But he is delivering you. And so that's the, the hope that we have and his nearness in our lives, his, his physical presence in a sense with us, his nearness to us in that way. What about the nearness of his return? Um, John 9.4 says this, we must work the works of him uh, who sent me, uh, the, or G, this is Jesus talking, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. All right, so Jesus uses this little analogy. Um, you know, it's long before electricity. If you've ever been out, uh, uh, like I remember when we were in Peru and you go places, I mean, they have like generators and stuff that they'll turn on for a few hours. But, but when you go out to a place where there's no electricity, everything just shuts down at night, right? I mean, you have fire and everything, but it, you can only really do so much with that. And so everybody thing just shuts down and, and, you know, people rest or, or go to bed or whatever, but there's no work that's really done at night. Why? Because it's impossible to do work at night. And Jesus uses this analogy um, to talk about uh, what is coming for us. Um, I have another little metaphor here. I need a volunteer to help me out. Carly, come on up. Oops, I should use some hand sanitizer here. Here, grab a pump of hand sanitizer too, Carly. All right, Carly, what you're going to do here, a stack of cups here, you can come over here. I have a stack of cups, and you're going to, one at a time, you see the, the happy face cup? You're gonna, one at a time, you're going to move these cups like this to the bottom, and you, at a, uh, just one at a time, you have 30 seconds to get all the way back to the happy face cup, okay? On your mark, get set, go.
15 seconds. Hey, you did it. I already get Carly a hand. <laughs> all right. So, Carly, would this have been a difficult thing to do if you had all day? No, it was a little bit challenging uh, with only 30 seconds. Yeah, right? When the time is short, uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit harder, right? If, if you had all day to do it, you can move one cup and then you can go do something else. You go, you know, go play or something like that. You can go, go ahead and go sit down, Carly. Thank you. Um, but you, you can go play. You go do something else. Um, but when the time is short, you have to be focused on what it is that you're doing, right? Um, this is what, what, what Jesus is getting at. When, when, the, when time is short, you have to be able to use your time wisely, you know, I, I, you know, I, you guys know I like uh, football, and I get so frustrated sometimes. You're watching. Have you ever watched a football game, and, and the team has like two minutes left, and you see guys, you know, just they're they're down by a touchdown, and they're just kind of walking up to the line. It's like, no, you gotta get going, right? Well, they walk up to the line the rest of the game, and I don't get frustrated, but I get frustrated then because uh, when the time is short, you have to use that time differently. You have to be, to be uh, to be better with that time. Um. I remember when I was a kid, I would, uh, I would, you know, I would, I would be, be at home and my, my mom might give me chores, you know, like I remember like one time actually I had, uh, very specifically, I had to water the lawn and, and everything, I had to clean up and water the lawn, and so, um, you know, she went and left for the day, um, and, and instead of doing my chores right away, you know, started playing video games or just hanging out, I don't remember what all I did, but uh, probably playing video games for a lot of it, and then it got to be, you know, she's going to be home at 5.30, and it got to be 5.20, and I hadn't done all my chores, and so I start frantically trying to do everything, you know, go out to the lawn and sprinkle the hose over it really quick like that and everything and, and, and everything. Why did I do that? Because I didn't want my mom to know that I'd been playing video games all day. And so I did a, a very poor job and all the things I really should have been doing so I could focus on the things that just uh, entertained me, the things that didn't really matter, that weren't important to do. Then you can see where this analogy is going, right, is that, that we have to recognize that our time here is short. Jesus is near. Jesus is near. We don't know when his return will be, uh, but I have more to say that in a second, but, but um, our time is short, and so we have to be able to use our time wisely. All right? Think about the things that you do in your life. Think about what you spend your energy on, your, your money on, your, what you focus your, your, your time and your, your mind on. If Jesus were to return tomorrow, how would you feel about those things? Now, you know, my, my mom is not going to return home and say, oh, you, you, didn't, you didn't water lawn, you didn't do the dishes, okay, out of my house. Right? This, we're not talking here about just you know, about earning our way into eternity. Jesus paid the price for us to be in eternity. But, but when he comes back, what's he going to find you doing? Are you going to be ashamed or are you going to be pleased with that? Now, you know, some people say, well, the, you know, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago, and uh, Jesus still hasn't returned. And I do think that Paul, like, if you had told Paul, like, actually, in 2,000 years, Jesus still isn't going to have, have, have a return, Paul would have been surprised by that. Like, I think he was expecting uh, more. Um, but, but I also don't think it's uh, um, untrue for us to say that, that Jesus is near, speaking of his return. And the reason I say that is, so in a week and a half, I'll be 39 um, so probably about halfway through my life, give or take. Um, and when I think about that, I don't think that 39 years is very much time. Right? I, what, the time I have left is not very much time. Right? Even like the youngest people in this room, like Bo crawling around over there, has statistically probably 70 or 80 years left. 70 or 80 years is not that much time. When you think about all that there is in the world, all the need that there is, all the ways that, that God's kingdom can reach and hasn't touched the world, that we can be preparing the world um, for Christ's return, when we think about all those things, all the meaningful things we can do with our life, our time here is very short. Jesus is near. Right? Not to mention... And I'm not trying to be morbid here because for us to live as Christ, to die as gain, so this isn't morbid, but, but there are more than one of us in this room that will die before we expect 
right? There are more than one of us in this room probably that will die early in our lives. Well, die in your life. You get what I mean, right? Once again, this is not to be depressing. I don't want to bring anybody down by this. We have hope in death, but we have the reality that our time is short. Jesus is near. And so we need to live our, our lives wisely. We need to do things that matter. We need to, to, to put him and his kingdom as priorities in our life and live in ways that, that have eternal impact and are not just focused on our entertainment and our pleasure. So that's the first thing we see when we talk about his return. The second thing that we talk about is that we have a hope in his return that Jesus will make all things right. We have a hope that Jesus will make all things right. And this, this impacts in a couple ways. One is that we don't have to obsess over making things, uh, making things all right. Now, now we have to, to balance that that we do work for his kingdom. But what I really mean by that is that when I am wronged, I don't have to obsess over getting revenge, making sure that justice happens to me. Uh, because I trust that the Lord will repay, that, that Jesus will come and he will set things right, that, he, that the ways I've been wronged, I can let go and release those things because he will make those things right. Right? Also, it affects um, how we look at the world around us, that we, that we trust him and his goodness. So, um, apparently I'm not listening to my own message because later today I'm going to be watching a football game. As you guys know, I'm a Chiefs fan. Um, and the Chiefs, this, uh, uh, later today, are playing in the AFC Championship game to, to go to the Super Bowl. Um, and I'm going to watch it. And they actually were in this game last year. They were in the AFC Championship game, and they won it last year. Um, now, uh, if I were to, like, I'm not going to do this, but if I were to go home and I was going to, like, okay, I'm going to watch last year's game, and then I'm going to watch this year's game, how would I watch those two games differently? Like, what, what would be different about what I'm feeling or thinking during those two games? I know the ending, right? So last year in their, in their game, they actually go down 10 to nothing at the very beginning of the game. When I watched it live last year, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Uh, I don't know if they're going to win. If I watched it now, would I have that feeling? No. In fact, when I watched them go down 10 to nothing, if I had to watch that game again now, and I watched them go down 10 to nothing, in some ways it was almost like excites me even more because of the greater accomplishment. Hey, they're down 10 to nothing, but they're going to come back and they're going to win this thing. Right? Because I know the outcome, it changes how I view things. And the same thing is true with us as Christians. That we know the outcome, we know the ending, we have hope of all that Jesus is going to do. And so when we see evil and darkness in the world around us, we are not overwhelmed, we don't say, God is not with us, God is not near, that God doesn't care. We see all the more the victory that's going to come when he returns with his kingdom, when he restores and renews, when he makes a, a new heaven and a new earth and a new creation that, that we get to be a part of, of we, we say that, that that is going to happen. We are excited about that. Right? In fact, when we see evil in the world around us, it, it, not that it makes us more excited, but, but kind of like what Paul said, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. God, God's glory is going to be even more glorious about what he is going to be able to overcome and correct in this world. It has been a challenging time for us. There is a lot of darkness in the world right now. But as Christians, we have confidence that it does not win. It does not carry the day. That our king is coming. And that he's already won victory on the cross. And that we can experience that and begin to experience that victory now and because he is near to us. And that we can look forward to his, his return. That he is near to his return. And we can look forward to when he comes. And we have experienced the fullness and completeness of that victory. This is the hope that we have. And so this is what I want us to reflect on as we move into our communion time this week. So Joe and Kel, if you guys want to come back on, come on up.
So you can come and uh, one person from each uh, group here come and, uh, re- and get uh, communion elements for uh, everybody in your group. There's uh, prepackaged little cups that have a wafer and a juice in it. So come on up and take those and take those back to your seat and then we'll uh, hold them and we'll take them together. started doing it every week um, during pandemic one because of the reminder that we're united as a body um, but the other thing that the communion does is it reminds us of this this idea that the Lord is near like we we're taking elements that remind us of the body and blood of Christ and some some traditions uh, and, and people believe you know it is the body and blood of Christ that we're receiving that we are communing with Jesus we're reminded of his nearness um and this phrase, the Lord is near, you know, why does Paul say it here? Is, is it's a command, it's, it's, a, it's a comfort and it's an exhortation. It's a comfort and it's an exhortation. What do I mean by that? It's a comfort in that Jesus gave his life. He died so that we could be in the presence of God again, so we could experience his presence. And I think that Paul writes this to the church because in any situation that you are facing in your life, anything that we are going through, any trial or difficulty, the Lord is near speaks to that. So a little different than what we usually do. I want you, what I want you to do right now, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture and think of what are you facing right now? What difficulty, what trial are you facing right now? And I want you to just think of that. And then I want you just to say and remind yourself, the Lord is near. And then take your bread. And just think of the comfort that comes in whatever that situation is of knowing that God is with you in that. said this is a comfort and an exhortation. So still kind of thinking of that same thing, whatever it was that you brought to your mind, I want you to think of the ways that the Lord is near, what it prompts, what response that it prompts from you. How is God wanting you to respond to his nearness? I want you to think of that thing again. I want you to say to yourself, remind yourself the Lord is near and take this juice think of of how God is wanting you to respond to his nearness. And 
so God, we thank you for the comfort of your nearness. God, that in trial, even in temptation, even things, times that we feel shame or condemnation, God, when we feel fear, when we feel uncertainty about life, when we're hurting and suffering and sad, that you gave your life and comfort us with your presence. May we remember that the Lord is near. And God, you are encouraging a response in us today, God, whether it's just trust and submission to you, whether it's an actual action of going out and doing something in response to your nearness whether it's facing sin in our lives, um, boldly being led by your Spirit. Whatever it is you are saying to us today, the Lord is near. And so may we be reminded of that, and may we not lose sight of that hope, God. It's your nearness that helps us to keep our joy. It's your nearness that helps us to to continue to be gracious to everyone. It's your nearness that allows us to come to you and make our requests to you and experience the peace of you. May we not lose sight of the hope that we have of your nearness to us, both in our lives and in the coming and your return. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Usually I close it with a go in peace, but the early church um, had another saying that they, they would say that kind of revolved around this. Um, is they, they would say the word Maranatha, and that means come, Lord Jesus, come. And so as we talk about the return of Christ and the nearness of Christ, let's just close by saying together, just saying Maranatha, and then we'll be dismissed. So on the count of three, one, two, three, Maranatha. All right, you're dismissed. <laughs>